Thanks, Daniel. Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Who else have we got? Anyone else there on teleconference? Any members sitting on mute by any chance? Uh, so Robin or Morris or Justin? Can. And Karen, indeed. No. Thoughts? We've just, just Daniel and Catherine that can hear us. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. Mark says we're coming through clearly, so... Um, okay, we'll record apologies for now, then. Is that adequate quorum to proceed? It is a Peter? quorum, yeah, yeah, just about, but so... Uh, Five, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well... Daniel, um, Catherine, William and Robbie and myself are here in the Senate chamber. Um, as is advised previously, you might want to follow proceedings via the Assembly website live stream to, to be able to see how proceedings are going as well. But um, in the meantime, hopefully uh, the other members will be able to join us as well. Um, I will approach our meeting today as previously in terms of calling all members to ask a question in order as obviously I can't see you indicating to ask a question via teleconferencing so I'll make sure we get everyone in. Um, if we can, as previously, try to keep our questions as concise as possible, hopefully that will elicit concise responses from the officials uh, and we'll, we'll get through business as efficiently as possible then. Uh, can I remind members that our main business at today's meeting is an update from the Permanent Secretary on the departmental response to coronavirus and the departmental officials are scheduled to dial in from 10 a.m. Is that correct, Peter? Yep. yep. Okay. <coughs> um, are members aware of any apologies? Sorry, Ted, for apologies, Chris. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Any other apologies? No. no. Okay. Then, as I say, hopefully other members are, are just delayed in, in linking in via teleconferencing and, and they will join us shortly. Uh, agenda item two is chairperson's business. Can I seek members' agreement to record the committee's thanks to those school and childcare settings uh, that are continuing <coughs> to oper, open, particularly over the Easter break, in order to accommodate? Uh, vulnerable children and children of key workers or members content. content Agreed. Yep. yep. Okay. Agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 8th of April at page six of your packs and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, agenda item four. Uh, is matters arising. There are no matters arising unless any members would wish to raise a matter. Nope. Correspondence okay. person is we're a wee bit early. Yeah, we are uh, ahead of schedule members, so we will proceed to agenda item six, correspondence, and ask the clerk to speak to the committee on these matters. So, Chairperson, at uh, page 83 of your packs, you have a summary note uh, around the correspondence. So, if I can ask if members are content to dispose of the correspondence in the manner suggested, and I'll just highlight, I think, maybe one thing, which is um, page 85, correspondence from the Health Committee. It's information from RNIB, our Royal National Institute for the Blind, on coronavirus and accessible information available online. So if members are, ask Chairperson, if members are content to forward this to the Department of Education and ask them to ensure that all of their information is provided in accessible format, uh, as suggested. Members content? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Okay. What are comments? We'll go on to forward work programme. Okay, then members will move to agenda item seven, forward work programme. Can I refer members to the draft for work programme on page 103 and confirm with members they are content to take a briefing on the 2020 to 21 education budget on the 22nd of April in order to inform the committee's contribution to the budget debate? 
Agreed. 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 Thank you. Can I also confirm with members that they are content to take a briefing from SIA on the 29th of April, um, or depending on the answers provided by the Permanent Secretary sooner? Yep. yep. Uh, members agreed? Agreed. 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 Can I also confirm with members they are content to take a briefing from the child care sector on the 6th of May 2020, by uh, which time the new child care package details will be well known? Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay. Can I also confirm with members they are content to take a briefing from the teaching unions on the 13th of May, by which time the way forward, hopefully, in terms of restrictions and important matters such as the teacher's pay deal may be more clear as well. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members. Clark, any other forward work programme issues to consider? Just for members' information at the back of tabled items. Uh, so this would be at, oh, it's right at the back, page 42. I've just included the executive summary of the uh, teachers' um, pay deal agreement. So you can see um, there was a 2.25% cost of living award in from September 2017, a 2% award from September 2018. When you add that all up, um, roll it back over four years, and then uh, inc incre include the increments. The total cost came out, according to the department, about 165 million. Um, so uh, that significant sums of money. Um, the department only got 227 million. Um, well, only he says, but um, given the, the the long list of of things that they had, um, that will obviously have some kind of impact on the uh, and certainly a constraint on the uh, budget arrangements that the department will be making. Um, so therefore, the uh, briefing on the 22nd might be interesting. Um, also, just in terms of forward work programme, the info from the department, which is in tabled items at the front, uh, it indicated that the minister would make a decision on the examination arrangements on the 14th of April. Um, I don't know that that's happened. So it might be something that members could pursue with the permanent secretary when they dial in. And uh, as the chair has indicated, if a decision is really imminent, then maybe SIA could come sooner. But if it's not, then uh, I think maybe probably sensible to wait to the 29th, um, by which time the announcement will be made, and uh, you know, schools will have time to feed back to members on on their views on the uh, the, the good or the the bad uh, 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 as they see it. Um, so if members are content with that, um, then I guess we could move on to AOB. Okay, members have any forward work program issues that they would like to raise? No. Daniel, Catherine, you can still hear us okay, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Okay, members then, agenda item eight is any other business. Do members have any other business they wish to discuss? Uh, no. We could uh, okay. have a cup of tea to our person and push the button again at 10 o'clock. Okay, members, I'm going to take a, a, a very uh, brief adjournment uh, prior to 10 o'clock just for a, 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 a comfort break and they allow other members, hopefully, to have dialed in. Uh, we're scheduled to go live with the Departmental Permanent Secretary at 10 a.m., so if members are content, we'll take a, a brief pause until 10 a.m. and we'll start at 10 a.m. sharp. Okay? Yep. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thanks, right. This is the Northern Ireland. Go ahead. Okay, members and officials, can I, I check you're all hearing me okay via teleconferencing? Uh, uh, Rob. Yes. Yeah. Robin, you can here, yes. Okay. Can I can I ask people just to introduce themselves so that I know who we have on teleconferencing there, please? Thanks. Okay, Robin Chair. Um, Robin yeah. I, uh, Chair. Right, Derek, just, Derek. just to be clear, I, I don't mean opening remarks. I just mean if, if members and officials could just state clearly who is with us on teleconferencing before we make a start. Morris Bradley. Morris Bradley, thanks, Robin. Morris. Robin Newton. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan. Thanks, Daniel. Catherine Kelly. Thanks, Catherine. 
Uh, Derek Baker, Chair and Minister Weir, is with me as well. Okay. Thank, thanks, uh, Prime Secretary and Minister. Any other members? Yep. No. Is Karen there? No. Okay. We're we're trying to dial Karen in, and we'll we'll persevere with that. But if I could welcome uh, Minister Weir and Permanent Secretary Derek Baker to our committee today, uh, thank you both for being able to join us again this week. We're extremely grateful for the the updates with which you've been providing the committee. Um, can I refer members to a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 14? For this agenda item, correspondence from the department at page 19, uh, indicating that it will provide oral updates on issue raised in correspondence from the committee. Uh, the Department of Education COVID-19 strategy and plan as of the 8th of April is at page 21. A copy of the department coronavirus responses at pages 48 to 71 and correspondence from the Department revising notices made under the Coronavirus Act 2020 at page 74. Any other items to which I need to refer, Clark? No, just uh, as indicated. Okay. Can I also refer members to tabled items, which includes the weekly update from the Department of Education on school and childcare provision and information on the teachers' pay and conditions matter? Uh, I can confirm then also that we have Minister Weir and Permanent Secretary Baker with us. Uh, by way of welcome, Permanent Secretary and Minister, can I, I thank you again for being with the, the committee today and record the committee's thanks for the responses that we have received in advance of today's meeting. Glad to provide you with 10 to 15 minutes to make opening remarks and reference to that correspondence and then take questions from the members. Keep probably the opening remarks that are more succinct than that, uh, in part, I think, because some of the issues discussed and uh, also we're able to deal with, um, although we're happy enough to reopen any questions on them. Minister, can I stop you for a second? Sorry, the, the volume um, on our transmission here in the Senate t chamber is extremely low. And I think the, the clerk is going to endeavour to address that, but if you if you want to try and speak as loud as you can, we'll, we'll endeavour to persevere as best as we can. That, that may be, uh, Chair, that may be a worrying challenge to the DUP member to speak as loudly as you can, but I will endeavour to do so. Um, I suppose what I was saying was I'll keep the opening remarks uh, relatively, relatively brief, um, in part to allow the maximum amount of time for questions. But also, um, the, some of the issues of substance, and I'm, I'm not saying that we'll be happy enough to take any further questions from those anyway. Uh, some of the, the items of substance that have developed since last Wednesday uh, have been sort of reasonably well touched on in the statement that was there uh, on Thursday afternoon at the, um, at the Assembly. But in brief, in terms of developments, um, obviously, uh, I suppose slightly unrelated to the COVID situation, uh, we were able to make a, uh, a writing out of the budgetary settlement while there's still aspects of that that need to be looked at because some of the things will be dependent upon other COVID bids, for instance. Um, I'd given, obviously, an assurance uh, to the union some time ago that if we got at least a, beyond, beyond a reasonable amount of, of financial support via the budget, that one of the key priorities was the, uh, ensuring that, that the pay settlement was reached. Um, I think last Wednesday um, that was then being put um, during the day uh, at a meeting of, of the TNC with uh, with the unions, and that has resulted then in the 68 million uh, from the budget being able to be uh, to be proposed to them. Obviously, they will be going through a process then of consultation, uh, specifically on the range of the COVID side of things. We were in a position then. Uh, along with health, then to make uh, a major announcement on uh, the child care and child binding uh, situation. Uh, that obviously is the three elements to it of, of a cadre of, of um, child care in the home, uh, of child minders, um, and indeed um, 75 settings where uh, effectively those settings would be provided with support to stay open for. Uh, for 
key worker children. Um, also, I suppose as part of that, there would be a level of support that's been given from that package to the childcare sector so that whenever all this has, has moved on, that we have a childcare sector at the end of it. Now, uh, again, there's questions that can be answered in relation to that. I think the only caveat I would add to that is the implementation and administration of that scheme, as it's a joint, uh, is through Department of Health, through the health trust. So in terms of some of the rule out on the ground, they're a better position to be able to do that. We're assisting with that. Obviously, subsequently as well, um, in terms of there's always been key concerns over vulnerable children, uh, and in particular that, um, that that goes beyond simply those who appear on particular lists. So I've written out to all the schools, asking them particularly at this time to reach out to vulnerable children, particularly those who are, if you like, on the cusp, um, where they would have that local knowledge. There's detailed advice that has been given to um, uh, the schools uh, on, the, on a wide range of issues concerning vulnerability. Uh, we've taken on board what's been said in terms of special schools and officials on Friday had the opportunity to uh, meet sort of with the strategic um, special schools, uh, some representatives of that, and there was useful exchanges there. Uh, as part of the other bit of the budgetary, while obviously the focus has been on uh, the, the childcare side of it, uh, was some additional uh, money which has now been made available for the youth service of EA to be able to step up to help with provision of meals, and that's resulting on a daily basis in about 3,000 um, children being targeted uh, with, with meals, which EA are, are, in terms of the youth service, are able to deliver. And I suppose in terms of just issues I wanted to, to raise, there's a few other items that are kind of work in progress, which hopefully will be coming to conclusions. Uh, but obviously there was issues raised around um, refugees, particularly the Syrian refugees. Um, we've been able to scope that down working with the Home Office. Uh, we believe there are 166 uh, Syrian children who uh, their families fall outside the remit of having bank accounts. Uh, and we've been working with the, um, the Home Office to ensure that they are funded via the uh, via sort of Aspen. Uh, obviously, as well, there's ongoing work, uh, I should also say, in terms of issues around clustering. I think whenever at the Assembly last Thursday we talked about 14 clusters being established, I think there's now 21 by the end of this week. And again, we're working... Oh, sorry? Uh, yes, and also, to say, sorry, the other thing we mentioned, uh, we were able to launch um, the Safer Schools app, which I think has been effectively uh, donated to Northern Ireland for the duration of this by Jim Gamble's company. Uh, and obviously, whenever we're talking about vulnerability, uh, nowadays it's, it's not just the pure vulnerability within the home, it's vulnerability on, online. And obviously trying to deal with the, the situation where um, trying to deal with the situation uh, where um, the uh, you know, sort of the children are spending a lot more time online. As we've seen with other aspects of this crisis, unfortunately there are people at times who will be out to exploit the crisis for their own sort of pernicious end, and we believe this is an important step uh, to be able to do that. So that's always a snapshot of where we are. Uh, obviously, there's other issues that are, are work in progress. Um, hopefully, the exam situation will be coming to conclusion very quickly. Um, and indeed, there's, uh, as well as that, there's also further bids in, or sorry, there's continuing bids in to uh, Department of Finance in terms of funding um, and that sort of thing. So that's, I suppose, just a, a quick shot across the landscape. But we're happy, obviously, to take, in Derek and myself, we're happy to take any questions on a range of those issues. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Permanent Secretary, do you wish to make any comments before we move to questions or content to move to questions? Just one technical point, Chair. In your opening remarks, you referred to our update report dated the 8th of April. I think the update report was dated the 10th of April. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, that's I, correct? I noticed that on the on the briefing. That's correct, Derek. You're right. It's the tenth okay. of April. That's, yep. No, that's fine. Um, that's okay. That's and okay. I, again, I've just um, emphasized to everyone uh, joining us via teleconferencing that if you can speak as loud and clearly and concisely <coughs> as possible, we are having some issues with regards to the volume here in the Senate chamber today. So project and uh, be as loud as you possibly can. Can I, I start then by bringing in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen? Chris, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I, I, as I say, if we speak as loud as possible, I, I think 
uh, those who are on teleconferencing can hear each other better than those of us that are in the Senate chamber. So uh, apologies if you get um, extra volume with each other on teleconferencing, but if you could speak as loud as possible for our benefit in the Senate chamber, uh, and I presume on live stream as well, that would be really helpful. Thanks, Karen. Yep. Thank you, Minister. And um, Derek, and I thank John there as well for attending today again. Um, I don't have a while off because, uh, you know, you have given us a lot of detail, which we're very thankful for over the last week. Um, and particularly, we picked up a lot in the statements on Thursday. Um, but it's just really to go over a few things. Uh, Ministry was saying 166 Syrians in terms of the bank accounts and the asylum seekers that we raised last week. I need to work on out um, in relation to bank accounts and trying to get a mechanism. Um, and I know that she's will do that as quickly as possible. It was said last week that the Department for Communities um, would ensure that those families had food boxes. Now, has that been confirmed that those families are being supported on a weekly basis um, by food boxes? Have they all been, as it ensures that they've all been picked up? Um, Karen, if I can pick that up, it's Derek here. Um, yes, sir. I think last week we were talking about four, or maybe even the written report that you got on, uh, with the cut-off on Friday. There were 420 families. As the Minister said, we've narrowed that down to 166. So um, we're working with the Home Office to get the money transferred through their Aspen accounts. But um, with regard to the work with the Department for Communities, in support of their wider programme, we have engaged the Education Authority's Youth Service, and they are now providing 3,000 meals to uh, children and young people whom we've identified or whom they've identified to be at risk or vulnerable children um, through their uh, Eat Well, Live Well programme. So they are getting food or will be getting food. I can't guarantee that it's the same 3,000, Karen. But we are reaching out to who, those whom we regard as vulnerable. And some of them may already be qualifying for free school meals, but we are supplementing that just on the yeah. basis yeah. of knowledge. Yeah. Like a form yeah. of safety net, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And, and I also wrote the um, Department for Communities Minister last week uh, on the back of our meeting just to you know, sort of reiterate that, that it was important that um, those were able to work. But, um, families and communities are involved and we're getting that spread out. So you're right, it's just trying to pick everybody up. In relation to the EA uh, food that you're saying, again, it's just really a point. It's important that they work very closely with those children who are uh, in the EA list. Um, and also, I raised this with the Trust on Friday, the, the Western Trust here in relation to children who would be on the at-risk register that the social workers are working with. Um, that m many people in communities find it difficult um, to get to <coughs> those who the needs. It is important that um, I suppose we're all connected up so that AAU is connecting them with the social workers advising them of their service and then when the social workers is in the home that we're trying to get to, uh, to reach to as many people as possible and just want to finish the point and commend the education youth service um their the last number of weeks the work that they have done has been outstanding i see it here first time i see the online service i see that the pack that's been out to families and homes so i just want to commend everybody involved in that as excellent work um, th thank you, Karen. Yeah, I mean, as, as the written report says, we've got 50, 56 youth centres who are reaching out to communities, but it's all within the umbrella of the overall strategy being led by Minister Hargey, um, and so we're trying to make those connections. I should also say, and uh, forgot to mention this in the opening remarks, it's, um, I don't know whether it's in the written report on Friday, we took receipt of a draft plan which will be led by the Department of Health to reach out to vulnerable children and young people generally. Now, this will be a joint effort between health, yeah. ourselves, communities and justice. I haven't actually seen that, so officials are working through that and hopefully we'll be able to provide an update report once we've worked through that and see that plan being um, put into place. 
But I, I'll need to come back to the committee on that. Yeah, no, that's great. And then just the last point, I know Chapman will probably raise it. Um, I know we have the announcements and plans that have been worked in relation to the child care stuff. It's just really, you know, <coughs> it's important that we can get that as much as soon as possible. I think because the Easter holidays are coming to an end, I've been getting a lot of phone calls where cluster schools aren't working for, or, or can't work for many of the key workers. Um, so if we can get a finalised plan and just for that to be a put in place, just well, I think. Yeah, I think, I think Karen, there, as I said, there are three elements that which are probably coming on, Steve, at different times. I mean, the first two will be sort of current childcare workers that will be in the home. Uh, second, into that, will be childminders. Um, and then there'll be the, the different groups. Obviously, particularly with the, the childcare side, most of the childminder side is targeted at a particular age range. However, yeah. there will be a useful level of spin off on that, which is, you know, if you're getting a childcare worker into your home, uh, and to be fair, it's probably the smallest element of that. Uh, then it's um, the not childcare worker. Maybe, if you like, looking their official role, maybe looking after a three-year-old, but there might also be a six-year-old in the house, and they can they can cover that. Uh, what I would say is uh, because obviously the bid came in jointly with health. At least at this stage, this is targeted in specifically at, at uh, healthcare workers who are in the yeah. key side of it, rather than the wider context of of, of key workers. But I don't know if it's something that will potentially develop as, as time moves on. And I know from having spoken to a couple of people, the idea is, I think, that the, the health trusts are doing a, a sort of an exercise from an HR point of view in finding out which of their staff uh, would be eligible and would need this. Uh, so it's about, if you like, sort of a matching yeah. service type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but in terms of detail, while we're assisting on that, uh, principally the driver of that is through health itself. Great, thank you. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Karen. So, ju just to just to summarise the responses um, for the benefit of Senate Chamber and per perhaps live stream as well. Uh, that was the issue of, in particular, of free school meals for asylum-seeking families, and the department has been able to access contact or bank accounts via the Home Office uh, to reduce the amount of. Um, families that uh, are in need of contact from 420 to 166, <coughs> excuse me, and via work with the Department for Communities and Youth Centres <coughs> are distributing approximately 3,000 meals to uh, families of that kind. Is that a fair summary, uh, Minister and Permanent Secretary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, um... thanks. Okay. Can I, I bring in William Humphrey then? Um, morning, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Can I also just take this opportunity? Thank you both very much for the um, leadership and commitment you're both showing at this very difficult time in education. And if you would also pass on our best thanks to those principals, teachers, and those across the school estate for the work they're doing in these most difficult of circumstances. Um, Peter, in terms of your your um, brief comments at the start. Um, you talked about Jim Gamble's Safer Schools um, process. Could, could you maybe just expand on that, what, what exactly that means? Well, it, it, it's an app which is available, uh, can be available through the schools, can also be available to individual parents uh, that are, are there. Uh, I suppose it, it uh, provides like a safeguarding online, provides sort of links into um, I suppose advice that can be there, uh, and also what sort of areas of support are available in terms of mental health as well and well-being. So it's 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 covering all those 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 aspects. It's um, uh, the Inic app. I think it's uh, uh, Inic is the name of the, the company, isn't it? That that would be there. Um, and I suppose normally, as with a lot of these things, it would be an app which schools could have used in the past, but effectively would have uh, gone on a commercial basis to. Uh, to Jim's company and hired. He has basically, by a sort of corporate and social responsibility, has offered this, if you like, access to the app for this period free of charge, uh, so it can be accessed uh, via, as I said, via schools, teachers or parents. Okay. Um, could, could I also then ask, in terms of the um, clusters, which you say have gone up from 14 last week to 21 this week, can we ask what those uh, seven new clusters are? 
the, the, the list, uh, I don't have them to hand, but the list is online in terms of, right, okay. in terms of that, that, there's 21. I mean, there, there's also sometimes where there's, they may not have registered us, so there's also some occasions, some of which have been operating from day one, where there's been also, in addition to the clusters, say the informal arrangements between schools as well. So even prior to the clusters, there were a number of schools, that, for instance, were happy enough to uh, either sort of take children from other schools or indeed, um, you know, I, I can think of one, for example, in the post-primary side of it, where two neighbouring schools, one was effectively accommodating for both type of thing. Quite often they were siblings of each other. So, you know, it's probably in addition to that, then there would be the 21, 21 clusters which are listed online. OK, thank you. OK, thanks, William. Uh, can I bring in uh, Catherine Kelly? Good morning, and thank you for, for meeting with, with us again today. Um, the announcement of the package to support child care last week has been welcomed um, and viewed as a step in the right direction by the child care sector. Um, but there are still outstanding questions um, both departments need to clarify and communicate to them. Um, as I mentioned last week, many settings have had to close um, their doors um, in the past few weeks. They urgently require a sustainability package to ensure that they can still function when we are on the other side of COVID-19, especially as many don't qualify for the Small Business Grant Scheme. I hope um, that both departments treat this with urgency and that it requires, and I will be writing to the Department of Health on it also. But when do you believe the sector will receive more detail on this and how will they be able to access it? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll deal first with just on the sustainability bit and then uh, the mechanics. I'll, I'll, this, is, this is a great opportunity because I can, I can try and deal with the, the easy ones that I can answer and then through the hard ones on the Derek in that regard. <laughs> Sustainability, uh, it was an important element of the uh, overall package uh, that we got, um, that uh, sustainability was a key part of that. So in addition, if you like, to the 75 who are getting uh, subsidised, for want of a better word, to be able to be open for, for key workers, because clearly to take an example, if you are capped effectively the equivalent of 20, uh, 20 children, that would be massively less than a lot of the of those those centres would normally normally take, so it wouldn't be economically sustainable for them to be open. That's something. But in addition to that, and out with the money that is that is purely going to sustain settings, sustain the uh, child care and child minding facilities, uh, as part of the twelve million pound package, uh, there's three point six million of that are effectively to help meet some of the costs of closed settings to enable them to, if you like keep going um, and keep their head above water between now and the um, uh, and the end of, of this process. That, that at least is for a three-month period. Um, clearly, if this went on for a longer period, there would be uh, further bids. I, I should say as well, that, that amount could slightly expand. There's a roughly about, in the 12 million, there's about a quarter of a million which is directly unallocated as their kind of a, a sort of level of reserve, which could go into that as well. Which would bring that up to about 3.85. Um, so that would be, I suppose, directly on the sustainability. But in terms of the mechanisms, maybe pass on to Derek. Just yeah, um, Catherine. Obviously, th this will be administered through the health and social care trusts, and specifically their early years teams. Now, as the minister said at the outset, in terms of supporting key workers. The main focus here was on those workers in the health and social care sector, and the trust DHR departments are analysing the information, and hopefully they will have it completed this week, by the end of this week, as to establishing the childcare needs of staff who work in the sector, and then they will be able to start, the, the early years teams in the trust will be able to start matching um, the needs of their staff to the uh, various support mechanisms that are part of this package. So it isn't in place yet. We'll be working through the early year teams in the Health and Social Care Trust to put it in place as quickly as possible. There are more detailed, frequently asked questions about this package on the Family Support website. But I know as we work through this, we need to supplement that. So the mechanics of it remain work in progress, but hopefully we'll be a lot further on by the end of this week. 
And I was going to suggest too, I mean, I, I don't know how much detail the committee has about the package. Maybe it doesn't have a great deal, but <laughs> I'm sure the clerk will request it anyway. But I suggest <laughs> a written briefing paper from the department might be helpful to spell out the different elements of the package, how it's proposed that they will operate, and that might be useful background information for you. Thank you. I think that um, the main issue at the minute, I think that it has been widely welcomed um, and a step in the right direction, like I've already said, but I think there's an urgency on the sustainability package um, and just for for both departments to ensure that that, that comes next week or, or, or whenever um, the rest of the, of the package is and the mechanisms are in place and to roll it out. Um, I think that uh, providers are really struggling at the minute um, and I'm hearing it day and daily um, both locally and from, from providers across the north. So it's just to make that point. Uh, also, Catherine, just, yeah. oh, sorry, just going just to say, Catherine, the other bit without uh, I don't think I'm breaking particular confidence. I mean, the initial package which ourselves and health had, had suggested by way of a bid was slightly bigger than what was eventually accepted. I suppose one of the complications we've got across the board um, is that, to be fair, the executive as a whole and the finance side of it are, are getting in bids which are massively in excess of what is available. So in this case, we got, I would say, roughly about 70% of what we asked for in terms of the funding of that. Obviously, if we got the full amount, there would have been a slightly bigger uh, sustainability package. There would have been slightly higher numbers of availability for that. Uh, I mean, I, I think the other the other issue which would have to then to be looked at would be if we reach a point, for instance, that in terms of the take up of this, that there is spare capacity within that. You know, I, I don't know if there's then there may be small opportunities to uh, reallocate some of that money additionally into sustainability. You know, so. We're looking at a minimum of 3.6 million directly on sustainability. I think that's likely to go up a little bit more than that. And it's maybe not as much as ideally uh, those within the sector would, would want, but I think it at least would make a considerable difference. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And just just one more point, Chair, if that's OK. Yep. Um, given that the child care at home scheme has been active now for a number of weeks, has your department seen a decline in children attending school as a result of the scheme? No, uh, it's, it, it, it hasn't really. I mean, don't forget, to some extent, the childcare element of it, it would have a very small spin-off in that, in that regard. Uh, the childcare element is largely aimed then at children who are sort of below school age. Uh, so you're getting probably, you would get a little bit of spin-off, but I don't, we've noticed any significant linkage in that, in that regard. No, Catherine, I mean, the numbers of children attending school tend to point to around been about 650 and just over 800. Um, last week it started to rise a little bit, but obviously towards the end of the week and certainly on Monday and Tuesday of this week, it really dropped down. For example, yesterday we only had 217 children attending, but of course that was over a holiday weekend. So I think yeah. it's too early to establish whether there are any clear trends. Thank you both very much. Okay, thanks, thanks, Catherine. Um, Minister and Permanent Secretary, if I could just supplement that, that briefly and ensure that uh, the, those of us in the Senate Chamber and, and live covered um, what was um, uh, discussed there as well. Obviously, the £12 million funding for childcare is extremely welcome. Um, we, but the, the key question is, what, what is the, the funding going to be per setting, um, per home child care provider, and when will that funding um, be received by those providers? And Chair, I can't answer that question definitively today, but we look into that and do a, give a report back to the committee once the arrangements have been put in place so that the money can start to flow. We do, we do have um, calculations um, which I suppose are an assumption against the spend on each individual element of the child care package. Um, and, you know, we can share that with the committee in due course, but really what pans out in practice could be very different. 
Okay, well, it, I think the committee would be very grateful for that written, written briefing with regards to elements of the, the child care package, and we would obviously emphasise, as we have done in, in most of our recent committee meetings, of the urgent need for that funding to be allocated and to child care providers that they, they remain in a precarious situation and the only region in these islands that hasn't received funding for child care. Um, is, it, is it worth us seeking detail from the Department of Health as well? Or are you content, uh, Permanent Secretary, to provide us with an update on the elements of the package? Well, it may, look, what, what I suppose maybe, from that point of view, Chair, sort of differentiation, we can supply you with the, all the elements of the package that we have. Uh, that's probably from a policy point of view, from a broad financial point of view. I suppose where health would have a particular level of knowledge which we don't have, or at least we'd only be getting second-hand off them. If you're asking issues around um, the administration and implementation of the scheme, uh, health have probably got the, have got the more clear oversight because uh, they're the ones implementing it. So, you know, if, if maybe you've differentiated into, we will certainly supply you ASAP with, with any of the details in terms of um, here's where the 12 million is, here's where the breakdown is, here's how places are broken down and the cost of those, you know, here's what's set aside in terms of sustainability. Um, we can give you, if you like, that bit, which was part of the bid. Um, uh, obviously, health can deal with the, the implementation side. And obviously, I appreciate what you're saying in terms of where we are compared to other jurisdictions. Uh, obviously, it was only um, last Wednesday evening that there was a, a green light given in terms of financing of this centrally. So obviously, in terms of the implementation, that none of that could really start to move until we'd, we'd reached that point. And I suppose we've had probably the slight degree of disruption of it's been like an Easter weekend over which health have been trying to, to start that, that process. But I know that they have, I know from talking to at least a couple of people who, uh, who have been um, involved with it, you know, I think that process at least has started. But th that's probably the two aspects of it. Certainly don't have any objection. You <coughs> seeking that information help. Okay. Well, if... if if you can provide us with as much detail as you can and we can follow that up with health as well. Two, two final questions in relation to childcare. Um, will it be possible for the executive to provide public liability cover for home child carers? And will there be PPE available for childcare daycare settings that remain open? Um, I think, well, I think there's, there's a, bank of, a bank of PPE that's available. Health could probably again uh, I know on the indemnity side of it, I think that, that health are involved with the indemnity, but I think we'll provide indemnity. Um, I'm struggling because actually, Chair, uh, I don't have it just directly to hand, but I know that I had a, a query in which we then passed on to health and I got a response particularly on um, on the issue of um, the indemnity side of it. So uh, if, if perhaps, if we carry on with questions, I'll try and look up where I have that information okay. and... Uh, We'll convey it as, as soon as okay. As soon as we're located, okay. Okay, thanks, Minister. Can I bring in Robbie Butler? Thank you, um, thank you, Minister and Permanent Secretary, for uh, being here once again. Um, so I've just got two brief questions. Um, just to finish up with Chris was saying that the chair was saying there with regard to the indemnity, Minister. Um, I take that goes into all daycare provision. The number of local um, daycare facilities have raised that, that concern that they can't get insurance. Uh, for staff, um, so that indemnity would extend beyond the, the home care setting into the day care setting, I take it, yes? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I'm, I'm, look, I'm just looking up, as I said, we've we'd got, we'd got queries raised about indemnity, so I, I know we've got a response, uh, which I think we're forwarding on to a particular uh, day care setting type of thing. Um, so it's just looking, um, just looking at, look, trying to look this up in terms of the detail of that, of that response, and I'll come back to you just on that. That's not a problem. Okay, so I've just got one substantive question then, guys, if that's okay. Um, and it's, uh, so, so this last day or two, it's been uh, highlighted not just by the, the Justice Minister, but also by groups like Nexus, Women's Aid, the Men's Advisory Project, um, Male Abuse and NI, which is a, a Lagan Valley-based charity, about the threat uh, and fear of a rise in domestic abuse. Um, and, and we t you did, Minister, in your opening gambit, talk about the vulnerable children. And, and we do know that schools offer, sadly, the, the, the safest environment some of, for some of our more vulnerable 
um, children, and I know, having looked at the report, that you're, you are working with the HSC um, on this. Um, but uh, but what, what my fear would be is, and, and whilst I do welcome the fact that this, our schools aren't um, full of, of pupils at the moment, and, and pe people are supporting um, our teachers, I'm also aware that we do have um, children that are on the register uh, for being vulnerable and at risk of various kinds of abuse. Um, we also have our looked after children population. And I just want um, some, some confidence that with regard to the work that's ongoing between yourselves and the HSC that uh, our most vulnerable children at risk of, of abuse and violence are uh, being protected at this time. And I, I do accept that it is a, a cross departmental um, issue. I'll pick that up, Robbie. Um, yes, I mean, we, we, we've spoken before about the, all of our concerns around this, this issue. I mean, we, we've covered a lot of the issues in the written report to the committee, and there's one point of note there that where the Education Authority is trying to put in place a process to track and report on weekly contact with vulnerable children. As the minister said, he did write out to schools exhorting school principals to make to maintain contact with vulnerable children. We're working very hard with all the health and social care services and all the education authority services to make sure that we reach out to vulnerable children, both those who are on various lists and registers, but those whom, whom we might worry about more generally. I said last week, and I think maybe Mr. McCrossan um, misinterpreted me when I said it's work in progress. It's work in progress because it's work that never stops. We just have to keep on at it and on at it and on at it relentlessly and get better at it. Now, I mentioned earlier too that we've taken receipt of the draft plan from the Department of Health, which will be a cross-departmental plan, and we need to dig into that too as to how we will support vulnerable children in their own homes who are not at school. So. Um, I suppose the assurance I can give you, Robbie, is that we are very conscious of this issue and there's a lot of effort being invested into it to make sure that we deploy all our resources, be it health, be it education authority, be it trusts, whatever, to support vulnerable children wherever they might be at present. Thank, thank you. And I'll just, I'll just, no more, no, I don't have another question. I just want to finish this one out. Just, um, and thank you for the work on that. I know the Minister had talked about um, an app earlier with, uh, uh, with William Humphrey. The other thing is just again, and I'm sure this is happening, but NSPCC online have got a uh, good facility and, and there's still the child line number. It's 0800 1111 for anybody that might actually be listening. Just to reiterate that, that some of, we do already have some existing resources that can still be utilised at this time. Oh, I know, just, and again, again, I think, Robbie, with all these things, um, it's the same way, I think, with, uh, with any forms of materials. Uh, probably the more that can be provided, the more choice that is there. It, it, these things are not really about replacing uh, things. If I can come back to a uh, couple of points just earlier. Um, right, on the four approved home child carers, uh, first of all, I think on the, the issue around advice and support, um, we've been advised by the Department of Health that uh, there is directly sort of advice which is available that's specific to approved home, uh, home care, uh, child care settings, um, and that arising out of that, also that advice will be there to parents. But also if there's specific advice being sought that the, the health trust can do, can also provide advice. In terms of the insurance, um, right, what it is indicated is Department of Health, it, at first instance, the, the um, uh, it says that uh, that Department of Health indicated that it will cover the cost of public liability insurance and also indemnify AHDs for related incidents. Now, DOH can't, they can't actually process the insurance, but what they can do is they can make any, they can cover any claim for reimbursement of funding uh, of insurance. So effectively, they're, they're stepping in to provide that, uh, that cover on the insurance side of it. And the, the specific arrangements are, are getting put in place by the Department of Health. Thank you. Okay, Robbie, if, if I could supplement uh, Robbie's questions with regards to uh, children at, at risk, Minister and, and Permanent Secretary. The, it's my understanding that the Department of Health reported in 2019 approximately 2,000 children on the Child Protection Register that is in, in danger of mental or physical abuse. 
Department of Education figures seem to suggest that 100 children with a social worker are currently attending school. And I note that the minister, however, suggested that the amount of vulnerable children currently attending school could be closer to around 750. Um, those figures, however, are significantly less than that 2,000 children on the Child Protection Register. So should we be concerned uh, that more of those children are not currently attending school? Well, um, Chair, I think you make a very valid point. Sorry, just so there's not confusion, if we're talking about the numbers of children, uh, we're talking about daily attendance covering both vulnerable children and key worker children um, in relation to that. Now, again, the figures sometimes will be slightly misleading because this will be uh, children sporadically uh, will be the case. Look, there is a concern across different jurisdictions, and this was an issue that was raised um, with the four education ministers about the, the low attendance rate of vulnerable children. Our position, I know this is no great comfort, is quite similar to what's happening in other jurisdictions. I suppose one of the additional complications with um, particular sort of risk of vulnerable children is that they, they quite often have quite a low attendance rate to start off with. And I suppose to try to sell a message that you need to be at school at a time uh, when all your other contemporaries are not at school is, is, a, is a difficult bit to do. That's why I suppose we're working closely with health and with uh, social services. Because, uh, look, again, the more that we can encourage and try to get children that are within that category into school, the better. Um, but I think there's going to be probably a, a, a likelihood that quite a large number of these these children will not be directly at school, and consequently, that's where the other support mechanisms that are there, uh, you know, become a vital, vital lifeline for a lot of these children as well. If, if not today, perhaps by a written response or at a future briefing, is it possible to provide more detail with regards to what specifically is being done to uh, identify? those children on child protection register or at risk of vulnerabilities I'm sure, I'm are being sure, yeah, to something, encourage them to attend school? Yeah, well, that's okay. Look, uh, we can uh, certainly do that. I mean, look, uh, the one aspect is that there's obviously the interaction with the children is that uh, we have tried to encourage schools as well to be where they can proactive um, in encouraging and reaching out to those children. Uh, additionally, as well, that's a letter has gone to, to all schools. But yeah, no, look, we'll get you, get you more detail on that, Chair. Okay, and figures had suggested as well that uh, as many as 25 uh, EODAS centres, education other than at school centres, uh, remain open. And I know I had raised previously the great work that is done at the Lockshore Education Centre as well. Um, what, what work is being done to support um, EODAS centres, the like of Lockshore Education Centre, to remain open in a safe manner, for example, in particular, by way of the provision of, of PPE to Lockshore Education Centre? Um, first of all, the, the issue on PPE, PPE is, is only required in very restricted circumstances. Uh, I mean, and where it is requested, it is provided, and the education authority is provided. I mean, for example, I, we referenced earlier the meeting with um, the strategic leaders of special schools. No special school is closed because it doesn't have access to PPE. None. And we've established that. So if PPE is needed, it is provided. But the same arrangements apply for EOTA centres as with any other school. Um, support is provided to the schools to encourage them to remain open if they wish to, and there, there, are link, there are link officers for each setting. But where uh, settings are not open, arrangements have been made to reach out to the young people in their own homes, be it from the schools themselves and the settings themselves, or via the education authority or via health and social care services. But if any IOTA centre has any concerns about the support it is getting, or indeed the support it is not getting, um, they should get in touch with us. But at present, you know, we're trying to support every setting that is open, and the same arrangements apply. But as far as we are concerned, and all the intelligence and all the information we are getting, PPE in schools or other settings is just not an issue. 
Okay. Um, Chair, can I come up? Is that Daniel? It is indeed. I was about to bring you in anyway, Daniel, so go ahead there, okay? Just in relation to special schools and PPE, there's some special schools, um, Minister uh, and, and Derek, that um, conducted risk assessments and deemed it unsafe to bring children into school. Uh, I'm just wondering what was the reason uh, that made it unsafe and, and was it anything to do with the lack of PPE at that particular no. time? No, I think, I think the, issue, the issue is about the, the difficulty you would have in certain circumstances in terms of social distancing for particular children. But look, we've got this, both in terms of the feedback we've got, and also arising out of that meeting directly from the horse's mouth, if I can use it in those terminology, it has not been raised. That there is availability of, of PPA. It has not been raised as an issue. Indeed, specifically, uh, they've been asked in, in connection with this. There is not a single school in Northern Ireland uh, of a special uh, that is closed because of lack of PPA. So that, that is not an issue. There are issues at times where there would be such difficulty enforcing social distancing that makes it very difficult for that particular school to operate. Yeah, they, I mean, on special schools, the feedback from the leaders in special schools is that the vast majority are closed simply because there is no demand from parents for them to open and they have no pupils wanting to attend. In other cases, some feel that they, as a minister has said, cannot exercise social distancing safely in schools, so therefore they have done that risk assessment and feel it isn't appropriate to open, or in some cases perhaps because staff are self-isolating, they don't have access to the staff that are needed to keep the school open, um, but it isn't because of uh, PPE, and that's the feedback that we're getting. If there is a PPE issue, the Education Authority has a helpline and they can engage with the authority so that we can source it. So is that unique to the circumstances of each individual pupil, or is that a blank decision that's taken for a particular school in terms of social distancing? Because I would imagine that uh, each special school would have a difficulty in terms of social distancing, given the unique circumstances and complexity of well, the child. Well, not, not necessarily. I mean, don't forget that in terms of, again, sometimes we tend to think of, of either special schools or statement of children as being sort of on a blanket uh, nature. There's a wide range of different schools providing different types of settings. Um, some, you know, will have strong medical particular needs. Some will have particular behavioural difficulties. They'll be at different levels. You take, for example, uh, then to give one example, the, the Jordanstown School, which is largely dealing with those with, with hearing impairment, which would be from, I think, either a social distancing point of view or they would not be in the same category. So, you know, there's a range of things that, that are out there uh, on that, so not all special schools, and that's why some are open in that regard. But probably the biggest thing driver in terms of special schools not being open is a, a lack of demand in many cases from parents, because for a lot of cases, very understandably in very worrying times, um, across the board, parents will, will, if they can possibly keep their child at home, will want to keep that child at home. I think that's a particular driver for many many parents uh, with uh, children with with particular strong medical special needs in that, in that regard, which, um, you know, they will want to, as they say it, have the safety of protecting that child in, within the confines of their own home. So I think that, that's the principal driver in terms of where we are with, with special schools. The, the, the only thing yeah. I would add is that, you know, there is no blanket approach to every special school. As yeah. the Minister said, every local circumstance is different. So this is where the leadership of the special schools at a local level comes into play, and they will have to do their own risk assessment at a local level, depending on their circumstances. So I suppose on the back of that, and thank you for the answer in relation to it, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering who conducts the risk assessment for a child with a substantial medical need then? It, at is it local level? Is it, each, is it each school, or is it social workers, or, or who determines that? The... the the special schools themselves would conduct their risk assessments uh, for the individual pupils and decide whether it is safe for them to be able to accommodate a pupil um, in the current circumstances. Okay. Uh, and and that, that uh, in itself, I suppose, is a bit worrying because it's going to be difficult to understand some of the circumstances, but and also whether a person is truly qualified to anticipate a risk. Which, because it's a medical issue, and that's why I specifically asked 
uh, a substantial medical problem. So is the person within the special school uh, equipped or qualified to make that judgment in terms of risk? Uh, and that would give me concern in these circumstances. Um, I suppose, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a very good point. I, I suppose the, the, the comfort I would offer you there is that the special schools are in close contact with the health and social care services in respect of individual pupils um, so that they can make those judgments and indeed so that they can, uh, so that the health and social care services where appropriate can reach out into the home of the individual young person where it is appropriate to do so if that young person isn't in school. Um, and, we, and that is that, that is where I say this is work in progress. It just keeps going on, and we need to keep working at it. Um, and we need to make sure that there is very close engagement between the uh, education system and the health and social care system. And we are trying to facilitate that and support it and make sure it happens. So that will continue. I appreciate this entirely. A difficult, complicated uh, situation, uh, but I, I would appreciate some clarification and writing, uh, if possible, uh, in relation to the measures that have been taken and who actually is carrying out the assessment, because I think it's important that we have clarification that it is someone that is medically qualified that's carrying out such assessments, and particularly in terms of such vulnerable children. Uh, just just on, the, on, on the side of that uh, as well, uh, uh, not, not specifically special schools, but uh, to all children. Um, obviously, we have a huge issue with domestic violence in homes, and, and that has been a concern uh, of the PSNI of the, uh, and of, I'm sure your own department and many others over recent weeks, uh, that when people are at home that, that there would be an increase in, in such issues within the home, uh, particularly in terms of, of uh, how that affects children. Uh, the difficulty for each individual school in trying to identify such vulnerable children is that social services don't always reveal the details of such, and it's only normally uh, on a need-to-know basis. So how do we get through that barrier to truly identify those vulnerable children that may be, uh, I suppose, deemed at risk uh, in the home? Um, well, clearly, the yeah, clearly, clearly, clearly social services are the lead organisation for that. I suppose what we're trying to do is to say, uh, look, um, and it, it's not about, if you like, anybody from schools effectively second-guessing or being able to have that expert knowledge. I suppose the point is that, that sometimes people in schools will have a level of, of uh, knowledge of, uh, of the, some of the children at school who may have, if you like, pick up information which is not there from social services. So what we're trying to say is that where you have that information, feed that in so this can supplement what is, what is there at present. Um, and if there's somebody who's not getting picked up by the, the system that you have a worry about, feed that, feed that through and try and reach out to them. And, and, and if I can just supplement that, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a very valid point, and it is precisely for that reason, the, the, the concerns that you, you raised there, that the Department of Health is leading on developing a cross-sectoral action plan on vulnerable children and young people involving themselves in health, ourselves in education, Department of Justice and Department for Communities. So we've got a first draft of that and we need to work through that. And as more details emerge, we will we, we, we'll keep the committee informed of that. And would GDPR present a difficulty in attaining that information where necessary? It might, and that's one of the details we need to work through. Um, actually, GDPR is an issue that has arisen here. The sharing of data across agencies in circumstances perhaps where we haven't had to share it so intensively is an issue that we need to be very, very careful about uh, and make sure we don't fall foul of the legislation. Now, the Information Commissioner has written to all authorities some time ago recognising that we are in um, extraordinary circumstances at present and acknowledging that that isn't to say that we play fast and loose with confidential personal data. We certainly won't do that, but uh, we need to find new mechanisms of sharing data in these circumstances. I absolutely agree. I think it's, it's vitally important that we have, our schools have, and the department has access to that information to identify vulnerable children that are at risk and, and also to move to help them. But I'm just uh, uh, moving away from that slightly. And, uh, um, uh, uh, we mentioned last week about supply teachers. Is there any progress on obtaining hardship funding for supply teachers? And are there other members of the education workforce, such as classroom assistants, who need to benefit from a hardship fund? 
have you sought any money for them in well, your bid uh, to the party? I suppose Daniel, in terms of there, there is a bid in. Oh, sorry, there, there is a bid in. Directly, directly speaking, has I'm not sure there's been much progress. Uh, there is one alternative which yourselves and finance are working on, but it would require something at the national level agreed. But broadly speaking, we have a bid in. Last Wednesday night, there was a tranche of funding that was made available to different departments, to which, um, in the broader level, the childcare element and the smaller element of the EA youth service element was able to be funded. There wasn't, um, in terms of prioritisation of that, uh, the, the funding for supply teachers wasn't uh, part of that. It's, it's one of the bids which at that stage wasn't met. Now, there is some additional money that has been made available, although I think some of the stuff in the media is not correct in terms of the amount uh, that is there. There's some money which has been held back um, to deal with uh, basically transport connectivity issues, uh, which, you know, uh, particularly Column, for instance, has, has made reference to. Um, we are dependent upon getting either green light or not uh, with that. Uh, you mentioned about others. Broadly speaking, um, anybody that, that has an ongoing... Um, it has an ongoing contract, be they a substitute teacher or a classroom assistant or anybody else, that is being honoured in full. Uh, for the bulk of classroom assistants, there are people that, that will be there, if you like, attached to a particular child, for instance, would be there at least until the end of the uh, end of the year. So that stuff will be relatively minimal and you may get a little bit of additional, uh, I think in our overall bid, there's a small amount that is there for general casual staff. Having said that, I think it's it's those are people sometimes who will be through agencies who will be doing very small bits and they're not in the same position as being the subject teacher list. So that's a much smaller element of things and probably the case, to be fair, is, is less strong in relation to that. But in terms of has any, has any money been delivered? No. Um, to be fair, I don't think there's... I think there isn't any lack of sympathy from finance or others. I guess just the problem on this is there's a certain amount that's been made available to Northern Ireland. That has been absorbed to present... There may well be some more money which can be absorbed, but what is being sought across a range of departments, and probably affecting nearly every department, um, is such that it will not be able to absorb everything. So that's just where we have to, uh, that's where we are at present. So, so Minister, how, how many sub-teachers are we talking about? How, how many are left in limbo, for want of a better description, in these well, circumstances look, we, that have no look, It's difficult, right, it's difficult to, to judge Exactly. Basically, I think the subject list has about 4,000 on it. I think it's the... What's it? More than that. Okay, well, the, there's like probably... Maybe more than that. that. There's probably um, somewhere... In the, the, there's a reasonable percentage of those will be people who will have uh, reasonably longer-term contracts. So if you take in the broader level of it, I think roughly there's an assumption that... Um, of the overall amount that normally would be paid in terms of substitute teachers, about half comes into, call it sort of that contract type situation, and half are entirely sort of casual on, on that basis. Now, proportionately, there would be more than half would fall into the other category, but given the fact you're comparing people who are effectively working five days a week with those who, some may be working a total of five days, some it will vary about from person to person, some may be on a very minimal number um, in connection with that. So. You know, you're probably talking at least a couple of thousand, um, couple of thousand staff, but in many cases, some of those will be working, you know, a relatively uh, limited amount of period. The, the estimates that I, I have here is around 6,000 sub-teachers that are affected. Would that be no, a I, high figure or would that be a reflective figure? I, I know in terms of those that, that are affected, I think that, uh, well, stand correct, that, that sounds quite high of those who would be um, potentially on the list. But don't forget, anybody that is a sub-teacher, for example, say somebody who had started um, and was filling out the rest of the year covering maternity, they are already covered at full, full rate. So anybody in that, that nature. Uh, I think, roughly speaking, if you take... Um, to give you a sort of a rule of thumb, um, of those teachers, sub-teachers, who in the January to March period were doing, um, say, roughly speaking... Um, half the week or more, i.e. two and a half days or more, it's around about two and a half thousand uh, that would be above that level, but that would also include people who are on contract side of things. 
So, yes, there may be people who are affected, and there's also as part of that, that package would cover all those people. Some of those people would be in the situation that they're called in once every couple of weeks. You know, it's, 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 the, the range within the thing is quite, is quite wide. The package that we have sought from DOF would cover all those people on a pro rata basis so that if there was somebody on the basis of taking the January to March period that was doing a certain number of days during those three months, and they were doing three times the much, as much as their neighbour, then whatever level of remuneration that, that could be supplied would be on the basis of a three-to-one ratio as well. It's on, on the basis of, of uh, it's scaled according to the level uh, of, uh, of work that they, they would be doing. Daniel, just to... I just need clarification on this, Chair, sorry. Uh, just, uh, I'm just trying to work out the number of sub-teachers that are currently sitting in this situation in limbo without any pay that have bills coming in and they're finding it extremely stressful because I know, Minister, you'll agree with me in saying that these are a vital makeup of the overall teaching workforce and are necessary to ensure uh, uh, that schools and, and uh, teaching isn't interrupted and, and are, are valuable in many, many schools across Northern Ireland. So I'm just trying to establish, Minister, how many teachers, sub-teachers, are sitting in this situation now with no money and there's no provision made for them. Daniel, before, well, Minister, sorry, before I bring you back in, Daniel, can I just check? The, the question we're asking is how many non-contracted substitute yeah, teachers yeah. are there in Northern Ireland? Yeah. Minister? We, we don't, yeah, we, we don't know. I wouldn't know the exact number of hand. Look, what, what I know, I've done a little bit of an exercise, Daniel, and uh, what I'm saying is there will be a pool of some of those people who, in any event, would be getting an absolute minimal amount of money. The, the position, I think, was... I. I Done a bit of an exercise, and this includes, because at, at this stage, if you're looking historically from a snapshot, you can't differentiate. I think the figures were that of those who were doing over the January to March period, roughly speaking, about 2,800 of those were doing 24 days or more. That's the equivalent of two days a week or more. So anybody on, on that list, and that includes contracted, uh, those who are on short-term contracts, and if you take that up to the level of, say, being 30 days or more, it's about 2,400. We're doing more than that. So the remainder below that, we're doing less than two days' work. You know, so it's, it's, there, there is a differentiation within that. The, the idea is that, that if we get funding, and it's dependent upon getting funding, that there would be a scheme which would then be able to provide a level of support. wouldn't be at full, full value, because don't forget as well, there are people without contract. Legally, I think, strictly speaking, there isn't, uh, they don't have a legal entitlement to uh, money, but we want to try and make some level of provision where we can. So, you know, you'd be stretching into a few thousand, but in some cases that, that would go from, from some people who on a casual basis are doing five days a week, most yeah. weeks, yeah. to others who might do, might do one or two days a month. The only other group that would be, that would not benefit directly from the scheme, there are around about 5% of the overall cohort are already on a teacher's pension and are effectively using this as kind of a supplement to their income. And we wouldn't regard those as being the same hardship position as uh, somebody who was just more generally on the, the list. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely, I, I understand that, but there is a, a significant number of young people, for want of a better description, yeah, uh, yeah. that uh, would have received, uh, even, though, even if it was two days a week, Minister, that was a couple of hundred pounds, probably. And am I right in saying at this situation, in this uh, state of limbo that we're in, that they're sitting now without any money? Well, uh, no, I think they would be entitled. I think anybody, for example, on that basis would be in the same way as anybody else who isn't working would be entitled, for instance, universal credit, would be entitled to the benefits um, system. So there's no... I mean, my, my point is, I'm sorry for cutting across it, it's, it's not to be awkward, I'm just, I'm just trying to establish the basis here. Uh, my point around this is, when, when we're seeing substantial grants, and I hugely welcome them, for the self-employed and for people that are laid off in their work furloughed uh, under the furloughed scheme. Are we seriously saying that sub-teachers are being treated differently from those uh, in, uh, the, uh, in, in another workforce and also uh, those who are self-employed? Because but the, but the I don't problem, think that's satisfactory. Yeah. No, look, Daniel, it, it's not. But here's the, here's the two issues in relation to that. They're not in the same position as somebody who's employed. They don't have a particular job. They don't have an employer. They're not self-employed, their, their analogous position is probably closer to those who are 
doing like a zero hour contract type uh, situation. It is important that there is support, but ultimately, from that point of view, if, if people are going to be getting the sort of money really that they should be getting, uh, there isn't a budget line for that from within the department. We can't take that away from schools who are not getting the service in, in relation to that. So it is dependent, and I want to make this absolutely crystal clear. If we were to do the maximum that can be done uh, for teachers in that, in that basis, on it will require additional external funding. I can't, I can't conjure it up, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. just oh, out of, out of, out of thin air. There isn't a budget line for those people on, so, that, you know, I just want to make that, that absolutely clear. But look, I think in terms of the equity of the situation, and then every avenue will be explored to try and see if there are routes um, around that. Uh, as I said, but it's not particularly satisfactory. They, they would be in the same position at the moment, I suppose, as somebody who is unemployed, who doesn't have, who doesn't have work, and would be receiving potentially would be receiving benefits on that on that basis. And I suspect that's where a lot of people in that situation are at present. So thank you, Minister and Chair. Just one final question, and, and Minister and, and, and uh, Derek, I, I appreciate very much uh, you answering these questions, and I know that there's quite a lot of different ones, and I can't expect you to go all the detail. Uh, on every circumstance that is going to arise in this crisis that we're in, and I do appreciate the efforts to be made at the department. I want to put that on the record. But just, just a final point is uh, around exams. I know England communicated two weeks ago, and I'm just wondering why we're waiting so long for a decision to be taken, Minister. Is well, it's holding it up? no, I mean, from well, no, from that point of view, there are a couple of aspects that will be done. I expect something very, very soon in relation to this, Daniel. What we did, uh, I'll explain probably two reasons to why we are slower. In relation to that, first of all, the situation, we actually have a bit of an advantage in Northern Ireland, which will help when it comes to issues around fairness and about getting the right grade for people which aren't there in England. Because particularly, for example, there is no linkage between their ASs and A-levels. Uh, we have a, a situation in which effectively the work that people do, largely speaking, progresses towards a, a degree. That means in England their data set is a lot less than what we would have, which means that their only real options of these things is purely teacher assessment. Um, ours, whenever it's announced, will have a mixture and is indicated of the data that's available on individuals uh, with also then a level of teacher prediction. That in and of itself is a more complex picture to put together because we want to ensure that we get the fairest possible position. It is also the case that we have taken time to ensure, and there were draft proposals um, last week, which of them were them working through, we took the time to actually consult with the key stakeholders, which would be uh, particularly the main representatives of the five main teaching unions in Northern Ireland. It means organisations like the Education Authority, like ETI, like CCMS, and like ASCO, uh, and the, the principals. You know, so uh, in one sense, we could have simply jumped ahead and produced something, but we felt it was important that we got buy-in for those which, largely speaking, I think, uh, is there. We've now reached the point where uh, there is, I think we're on the verge of an announcement. The only thing which is just the final point which is being put in place uh, will be there is detailed advice which is being finalised, which will then go out to schools from CCEA and also be available clearly if parents and others want it. I want to be in the position that when the announcement is made on the detail, that that advice is ready to go instantaneously. I don't want a position that I announce on a, a particular point and two or three days later the advice is there. The two have got to go hand in hand. But I would anticipate uh, a very imminent uh, announcement on that within the next couple of days. Can I, can I just add on examinations, Daniel? I mean, SIA has done a lot of excellent work very, very quickly on this. They gave us detailed proposals the week before last, as the Minister said, Last week, we took the opportunity to consult with key stakeholders, whom the Minister has mentioned. That was really, really important because they came back with some good points. And all of that has now been consolidated into a detailed package, which the Minister is considering. And as he said, an announcement is imminent. That, that's very positive news. And just to thank you both, Derek uh, and uh, Minister Weir, for Again, as, as I said on Thursday, you're open this to this committee and our, our members, and also the constant update that you're providing is deeply appreciated. I know we're in crisis <coughs> at very difficult times, uh, and, and I think it is very important that we have access to you, and we deeply appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Um, 
Minister, Power Secretary, a brief supplement. Can I ask what feedback the key stakeholders gave in relation to the exam proposals? Um, Chair, they were broadly content with all of the proposals coming from SPIA. They made some very useful, detailed comments of, um, you know, about sort of technical aspects of it that SIA will have to build in to any work that it puts in place to make sure that grades are awarded. Um, but there, was, there were no significant um, problems raised. Uh, collectively, all of the stakeholders felt that the recommendations coming forward were the right recommendations in our circumstances. But as, as I said before, it was really important to engage with the stakeholders because there will be a lot of work for everybody to make sure that we get through this process and can award grades robustly and fairly. And it's important that we took those views into account. I mean, it's also the case that um, the complexity of the situation people may not necessarily realise because we're talking about A-levels, uh, sometimes referred to as, as A2s, which are the sort of the completion side of things. We're talking about AS levels. We're talking about GCSE, what's called GCSE terminal, which is what most of us would associate as being sort of the end of year 12, and also GCSE modular uh, situation, which is a particular sort of work in progress situation of a grade that, that can be given then at, at the year, year 11. The information that is available to be able to... Um, be able to provide those those grades is different for each of those four sets of, of, of circumstances. So it's about trying to provide the best possible solution. I think, to be fair, it is also the case that what is with that, uh, CCA have scoped out in each case a wide range of options, tested against the against range of criteria, which again will be part of the overall uh, announcement. And in each case, the recommendation will have been what is the best possible solution for that? There is no solution for any of these, which is absolutely perfect, because the perfect solution, you know, would have been COVID not happening and the the, the normal process of exams and grading taking place. So this is, by its nature, it is the second best in that in that regard. But we're making sure, if you like, it's the second best rather than the fifth best. Okay. And was there any feedback or what thinking has occurred in relation to? appeals mechanisms or indeed yeah. re, re, reset mechanisms well that will also be part of the that's part of the overall package that that's there and again will be part of both uh, an announcement and also the guidance and, and advice uh within that okay just one other brief uh, matter that uh, daniel raised as well and and that you you raised in response with regards to the department of health cross-sectoral action plan on on vulnerable children is there currently a, a waiting list of pupils seeking to currently attend schools? Yeah, Chair, I'll try and pick this up first. Um, this is a difficult one to measure. Um, it's easy to measure. We, we, as you know, have a daily survey of schools. Many schools are getting a bit fed up with it, but it, it's very easy to get hard information on the schools that are open, the schools that are closed, the number of staff who are there and the number of pupils who are there. It's a bit more difficult to establish with any great certainty the number of parents who would like their children to attend but are, who are having difficulty. Uh, the big benefit on that front recently was the establishment of the Education Authority's helpline and online facility to support parents to find a suitable school for their children. And over the past um, couple of weeks, the number of parents who are contacting that helpline and who are uh, identifying a problem with getting their children placed has fallen from what we estimated a couple of weeks ago around the 270 mark, and it's now about 100 and falling every day. Um, as part of the helpline arrangements, the Education Authority assign a caseworker to each individual child to help place that child. So um, it's not perfect data. Um, it's based on approaches to the helpline, but it is a situation that's improving significantly. And it's largely because of the work that's going on in clustering and the linked officer working with every school. And there's also, I suppose, a, a smallish problem within this in terms of numbers, which, um, for instance, the child minding service may be able to provide a solution which the schools can't. 
which is there's a, a core of people within that who their difficulty in getting a placement is because their current sort of hours of work are such that it, it really, to be fair, isn't going to be particularly compatible with the school. So it might mean, for example, um, that uh, a service which would be available to maybe in normal times, that particular key worker is working until 7 o'clock at night. So it's not probably really going to be doable for a school to be open to that, that level of time. That's where I think, because obviously the childminder service is one that, that at least in terms, of the, uh, in terms of primary age, goes beyond simply sort of the two- and three-year-olds uh, situation, may be able to provide certain bespoke solutions for that. There's, there's, out of that hundred or so, there's call it a hardcore within that, who with the best will in the world, every school in the country could be open. And it wouldn't necessarily, for some of those people, and this is no fault of theirs, be able to provide a solution for them. Okay, and in, in terms of the, the number of children unable to access school, how many of those children are in a vulnerable category? I, I haven't got an answer to that. Uh, I just don't know. And I don't know whether we collect that information um, specifically okay. via the helpline. Okay. Uh, but I can check whether we do. Okay, briefly as well, can I also welcome the meeting that you had with the Special School Principal Strategic Leadership Group? Um, I, I take on board what you've said in terms of um, the closures being largely with regards to demand and social distancing challenges, but we are receiving some feedback from families of children with complex additional needs who do feel somewhat abandoned. So how is the, the learning and the health provision be that occupational therapy, physiotherapy, speech and language therapy, medical provision that is normally accessed um, at special schools being sustained by the Department of Education and the Department of Health at home? Yeah, we've covered some of those issues in the written report. I mean, you know, we, we get some of that feedback as well. And speaking to, I wasn't actually involved in the meeting. It was a conference call. Uh, but some of my colleagues were, and senior officers from the Education Authority were as well. I mean, I suppose I just have to repeat that for each and indiv each individual child, um, it is a process of the special school engaging with health and social care to see what services can be provided in the home on an outreach basis where they cannot be provided in the special school. But it retain it 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 it. it um, is work in progress. We are aware of some particular difficulties that the special school principals raised with us. Uh, it's a small number in the grand scheme of things, but nonetheless, this is important to each and every child and each and every family, and we need to continue to work through those cases. You know, so for example, um, following the meeting on Friday, I spoke to some colleagues who were at the meeting, and um, whilst you know, in total there are. 6,000 children attend special schools in Northern Ireland. Um, a figure of about 13 difficult cases were mentioned to us on Friday. So we need to work through each and every one of those cases with the schools and with health and social care services to make sure that appropriate provision is provided. This is difficult work. Um, I'm not saying it's easy. It is suboptimal, the fact that schools generally are closed. Um, but we just have to continue to work through it with health and social care colleagues. Okay, well, maybe we'll seek further update on that at future date then, Permanent Secretary. Can I bring Robin Newton in, please? Uh, thank, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister and Mr. Baker, for their attendance uh, today. Uh, I have to say I agree with the Deputy Chair and, and Daniel. Uh, three briefings within seven days. I think is uh, stands a testament to the commitment of the minister and his permanent secretary. Today, thank you for the strategic plan that uh, you've provided. I think it's extremely useful, and the detail I think is, is excellent in it. And uh, I have to say, uh, since we raised it last week, about the the, the needs of uh, children at risk, uh, I've been extremely pleased with the progress that's been outlined. Uh, within the the uh, plan, uh, I ha have only no specific questions, but maybe more comments that you might respond to, uh, Minister or, or Mr. Baker. 
I have to say I do welcome the Department of Health uh, work that's being on the cross departmental action plan around vulnerable children and the fact that that's being led by health that's involving communities and justice and yourselves I, I think is a, a, an excellent uh, piece of work and uh, I think that will uh, undoubtedly pay, pay benefits uh, for the future. Minister, you said that you'd written to, you reported that you'd written to all school principals on the 8th of April, and indeed that the education authority is working on a program process to track and report and weekly contact with vulnerable children. Uh, I suppose it's too soon to say what response you will get from the school principals at this stage, uh, but I suppose that we could request that you would update us on the educational authority uh, process to track with the, the, the vulnerable children. So would you like to make a comment, first of all? No, just, uh, yeah. from, that, from that, Robin, yeah, no, we'll, we'll certainly keep the, the committee updated on uh, responses. It is probably, given that, the fact that it's Wednesday, given the fact that uh, we've had sort of the Easter weekend, it is probably yes. too soon to get responses. What I would also say is that part of the purpose of the letter, large part of the purpose, was to urge schools to reach out to those pupils. Now, whereas there will be some level of feedback, in many ways, it's not necessarily one where they're going to be writing back to us saying we have done X, Y, and Z. It's to kind of send a message that that uh, there needs to be. It's just kind of a reminder that there needs to be that awareness that's there, and perhaps it goes beyond simply relying purely on what's there from the social services side of it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I, I do welcome. I have to say, I do welcome the contact that was made with the likely debt of the chair the Special School Strategic Leadership Group, and I, I think uh, the clarification that you've provided so far today on the report, uh, I think uh, that, that uh, in the strategic plan is uh, indeed extremely valuable. Can I, can I just raise with you, uh, on the vulnerable children world, where you talk about the health service provision and ongoing engagement is taking place with the health and social services and the EA colleagues, uh, again, uh, I think it has already been asked, but uh, I think it would be useful if the committee could have an upgrade, an update on, on the work that is being done there uh, as, as you go through that. Um, yeah, it's, it's Derek here. Um, well, I, I think the written report uh, provides most of the details of the contacts that are existing between the education sector and the health and social care sector. Um, I mean, I, I, I fear I'm probably going to end up repeating myself, so I'll not labour the point. But um, in terms of uh, special schools, we are encouraging the principals and support, and the principals are reaching out to the health and social care sector to make sure that what services can be provided in the home are being provided in the yeah. home. Um, the full range of other education authority services for maybe vulnerable children who aren't uh, attending special schools con continue to be available. And um, I would be hopeful that the um, Department of Health-led plan, but it is a cross-departmental plan, will yes. provide more system and structure and form around efforts of all departments to make sure that no children fall through the net in, in these difficult circumstances. Well, I think that's where my concern lies, and I, I do welcome the, the strategic plan, Chair. Sure. Uh, I do welcome the progress that has been made against uh, the, the issues, um, and I do, again, thank and reiterate uh, that three briefings within seven days, uh, I think, is a first-class effort. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Can I bring Justin McNulty in? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Peter, Derek, and John, um, for your time um, and for your enormous efforts thus far in dealing with this pandemic. Um, two questions: is, is any evaluation being done in terms of uh, the delivery of education? Um, issues have been raised in relation to accessibility to internet and support for kids with learning difficulties. Um, I guess is there a mechanism for teachers and parents and pupils to feedback on their new norm in education? I know, I know there is a daily survey 
that you've mentioned the number of times, Derek, but is there any mechanism by which you can actually assess the, the, the impact and how, how the education is working right now? Well, I think that uh, the, the, you're right, just in terms of like, the feedback is useful. I suppose where there's an overarching examination of what's, what's happening, certainly on that basis, is ETI are keeping a, an eye on this as well, and they're, they're monitoring the, the issues around remote learning. But no, Derek, you want to... Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. I suppose the irony was but that even before the pandemic, inspection wasn't happening um, because of the industrial action. Um, th th there is no formal evaluation going on of the distance learning, um, simply because I, I really don't know how it would be done. I suppose just to reiterate the Minister's comment, we have deployed the education and training inspectorate staff to support schools where appropriate in the provision of distance learning to make sure that good practice is identified and good practice is disseminated. And there's a lot of good practice also posted on SEA's website and on the Education Authority's website um, uh, to, to support that. But the short answer to your question is there is no formal evaluation of that going on uh, because at this stage I really don't know what the mechanism for such evaluation would be um, in the current circumstances where the vast majority of children, you know, well over 99% of them are at home and I really don't know how we could evaluate that. Yeah, it's a simple one. Um, but I'm sure there are means and ways in some manner, but listen, it's something that like, maybe you can give some thought to. Uh, Minister and Derek, um, have any efforts been made to distribute the digital hardware that schools hold to those kids who do not have access? Um, I know there may be insurance or repair issues, but surely there is sense in having the, the equipment that lies in schools dominant now to be out with kids who don't have access at the moment. Um. To the best of my knowledge, I think the answer is no, unless it's happening at an individual school basis. Um, I think school, schools will, will, will face the particular challenges within their own um, location. Some will have done this by way of digital learning, some will have done it by way of PACs, and I'm sure schools will show, try and show an awareness where they feel that there's any gaps they can try and fill as soon as possible. I, I don't think there's, there's not a dictate from above to sort of say, here's the way that it's necessarily done on that basis. Yeah, I mean, I think w we do know that where um, individual schools are aware that their pupils maybe don't have access to digital services, they are preparing hard copy resource packs for those children. But there is no central policy uh, which is encouraging schools to provide their hardware to individual children or to hand that out uh, that I'm aware of. But I can, I, I can check whether it is happening in practice at a local level. I just don't know the answer to that one, Justin, so it's a fair question. And should it be a, a central policy, Derek, whereby you can suggest that to schools? I, I don't know. I don't know is the answer. I'm sure, you know, it might, it might prima facie sound like a very, very sensible and reasonable thing to do, but then someone will tell me, give me a hundred reasons why it's not possible to do, because if the kit is in school and if it's hooked up to the network, it might not work if we deliver it to somebody's home and it's not hooked up to the network, if you know what I mean. Um, you know, a lot, of, a, lot of the, a lot of the IT in schools is connected directly to the school's network, so unplugging it might not be of any benefit to anybody whatsoever. So I would need to take advice on that one, Justin, because honestly, I don't know the answer to the question. Okay, thank you, Derek. In terms of vulnerable children and children with uh, special education needs, in relation to the evidence we've... Uh, I know I touched on this last week, but I'm not sure I've got an answer. In relation to the evidence previously presented to the Committee on Children with uh, Special Education Needs, can you give us an update on what impact has COVID-19 had on the reform of that service? And has the minister any idea of the staff? No, I, look, the I think. I think. Was I? We, we, sorry, in terms of the transformation of, of, of that service. Yeah. I think. I think the one complication, Justin, is with a range of transformation projects that probably had to effectively be put on ice for the period, at least of this this happening, just because it's very difficult to process uh, those side of 
that, that side of things on it. I, th- I, I think also, Justin, uh, the committee has owed a written response to that. From recollection, I think the clerk wrote to us last week, and there were a couple of issues on which we're to come back to the committee in writing, and I think that is one issue that we're to come back to you on. Okay, thank you, Derek. And, and any idea what uh, the impact of stock absenteeism because of COVID-19 is having on uh, supporting vulnerable children? Well, um, in the in in the department, um, you know, are you, are you talking about Justin? Sorry, just to clarify, are you talking about from the say support side of it from Department of EA, or are you talking about say sort of within schools absenteeism with the with teachers who self isolating and that sort of thing? So hey, everything, everything. Yeah. Well, I think I think from from the point of view of of everything that can can get done. I mean, we we've, we've not had. Starting from a departmental point of view, we've not had. Um, obviously, it's, it's more difficult to manage things, you know, with everybody out there remotely. But we've not had really an issue about staff absenteeism um, on that basis. People are still performing their duties. In cases, quite often they've been redirected and redeployed. Um, I, I think, think from that point of view, there, there, there doesn't appear to be a great deal of evidence that um, that the, any volume of, of absence it may occasionally vary. From individual school to individual school, I don't think systemically there's a great deal of evidence that there's a lack of support for vulnerable children or others because of general absenteeism. Yeah, I think I think Justin. I mean, obviously, right across the board, including at the assembly, um, people working remotely is often suboptimal. But all of the education authority services which normally are available to different groups of children, be they looked after children, be they children in IOTA services, be it the intercultural service. These are all working normally, and they're reaching out to children and young people, um, albeit remotely. Um, But obviously, face-to-face contacts are not happening in the way that they used to, and that obviously is impairing the service to some degree. But we're keeping all of the services going as best we can. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the vulnerable at risk kids out there, and we've been discussed at length already, and I'm sorry to go back into it. Um, <coughs> just in terms of the organisations such as the NSPCC, as already mentioned by Robbie and Bernardo's, has the education um, department reached out to those organisations to see what their knowledge is in terms of any surge in, in uh, supports needed by those organisations. I know Derek you've already mentioned the, the strategic plan, there's a first draft almost ready, I think you said. Um, and notwithstanding GDPR issues, what's what... Uh... Oh, we lost. To more inform any actions taken. Sorry, just, just no, that was a bit... At, at, at the... Uh, they sort of they they sort of they sound broke down in the middle of that type of thing. Like, but I guess you're sort of saying about what contact there's been and what actions. Is yeah. correct? NSCCC and Bernardo's will have information which the education authorities should be using to inform their actions going forward. Yeah, I think all of those contacts, Justin, are still in place. We have actually been in touch with the NSPCC and with Childline and with Bernardo's. Um, during this period to see how we can help each other. So I think, as the Minister said earlier, it's a case of both ends. All of the existing statutory services are still in place and being provided, and all of the third sector uh, services are still in place. We continue to fund a number of those. Where we need to make connections, we will make connections. I think a very good example of the link-ups we made were um, the Minister's announcement of the Safer Schools app um, at the end of last week, where we engaged with the third sector to put something in place to uh, promote online safety of young people. But um, the links continue, and uh, we'll continue to work with any organisation where we can to ensure that the proper uh, safety net is there for vulnerable children. Okay, good. Good, Dirk. Thank you. And uh, what, what bids are before the Minister for Finance now for consideration? Well, look, uh, there's a there's a range of bids. I suppose uh, probably the 
the most significant ones will be around the um, around the the uh, we call the supply teacher side, substitute teacher side of it. Uh, there will also be, although it may need to be refined, there's also a bid in in particular uh, on the issue of uh, examinations because whatever precise route has gone down, um, whatever action is taken, there will be additional costs because obviously you're talking about a more complex situation where there'll be more work that will be needed. So there will be some additional finance needed in relation to that. You know, There's a range of, of probably other smaller issues, some of which are probably are things that generally speaking, could be absorbed. I know issues around, for instance, the Education Authority will have had some extra costs, for instance, in terms of cleaning. Having said that, there will also be, I think, within some organisations, some level of offsetting costs. So, for example, a cost in cleaning will go up, but there will be some savings that will, will occur through, for example, in terms of school transport, there won't be fuel that will be needed, uh, certainly to the same extent in terms of school buses. So, you know, some will balance out as well. Uh, like across the board, um, you know, there, there is much more being asked collectively by departments from what is what is available. So I think that's that's the complication in relation to that. But you know, I would say that probably the the principal bids would be around the substitute teacher side of it, and um, to a lesser extent then the, the the exam side of it as well. Okay, and finally, I know also raised the issue with PPE. That's already been discussed uh, in terms of mining those children with of key workers and teachers being vulnerable without the correct PPE. Well, thank you, right. That was that. Um, have have any thoughts been given to turning the lights back on and how that is going to be um, really phasing, opening, phasing of reopening schools? Has that been given any well, No, I mean, look, I think, it, I think at this stage, I mean, look, we're looking at, at broadly speaking, we have a, a small group looking at, at you know, what the position is whenever we reach closer to a point at which uh, some of those things can be considered. Look, I think it, it seems to be fairly clear at the moment that there is not, and I think it's probably collectively agreed, that in terms of the measures that have been put in place, there's not going to be a swift um, or, or early uh, movement in terms of reactivating, moving towards being normal in that, in that regard. That seems to be some way away. I think whenever... Uh, if I may sort of probably slightly mix metaphors here, we say, start seeing the green shoots of recovery and a situation in which, in the wider context of the executive and society, we're starting to consider those issues and there'll be more detailed thought given to those. But at the moment, it's really, I suppose, it's been trying to cope with the situation at present. Um, uh, you know, there will come a time when clearly lights uh, will go back on and work, work will be done, but I, I don't anticipate that in the very near future. Okay, thanks, sir. Sorry, one, one quick final one. Will okay, you last one, Justin, please, thanks. Go ahead. Sorry, Derek. Yep. Will you, will you honour the contracts with school bus companies? Yes. Uh, all contracts, all external contracts um, are being honoured, whether that's sort of employment contracts or particularly on the transport side of it. If there's an EA contract with a bus company, it gets done. What What is also probably... Um, a bigger issue, and I know there's been some issues on the ground in relation to this, is also the case, for example, that where there is contracts with the EA and, say, taxi companies, where there's particular individuals need to be taken, those are also being paid for uh, the rest of, of uh, this, this school year. Now, I know sometimes, I've had anecdotal evidence that sometimes there's been a little bit of friction between some of the taxi operators and their drivers, but that's, if, if you like, an internal matter on, on that side of things. The EA is, is aware of that. So any contracts that are there are being being honoured on that basis if, if there's a contract being entered into. Okay, Chair, can I just back briefly with a point? Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, just, uh, Minister, I welcome what you've just said because it was actually something I was going to ask when everyone else had uh, got an opportunity to, to uh, put a few questions to you. I spoke to a number of taxi drivers uh, in the recent days, and they said that originally their understanding was that they'd been paid up until the end of June, uh, as agreed with the Education Authority. But since that, the Education Authority have written to them to say that this is going to be subject to review at the end of this month. Well, uh, we're not we're not aware of that. And I mean, if, if, if from that point of view, Daniel, if, if for example, there is specific uh, correspondence. Yeah. that you would have or could get to us, I'm sure we'd be happy to, to look at that. But certainly my understanding is that they're being paid uh, until, the, uh, until the end of June. But um, 
as I said, look, if you want to get information to us, we will then explore that issue with the EA. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Okay. Okay, Justin. Yeah, thank Thanks. you very much, Minister. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Chair, uh, Minister, Permanent Secretary, um, and sorry. Morris has Oh, yeah, I'm going to bring Morris in as well, just in one second. Um, just a couple of important points that Justin raises in terms of remote learning. Um, it, it it does seem um, necessary to have some degree of evaluation of monitoring regards any inequity in educational opportunity as a result of variable access to computer or internet resources. I know you've said that schools are endeavouring to provide hard learning packs, um, but are we monitoring um, any risk to unequal educational opportunity as, as a result of that variable access to um, ICT resources? Well, I think sort of ETI are taking an overarching look at this. I guess the issue a little bit will be uh, if we find, and you know, it will not be absolutely uniform across the bit, I suppose then the issue is what particular corresponding action that can be taken to either correct that or to in some way um, make that, which is very difficult to see what, what way you can do in relation. I mean, you can't, do think you can really say, for example, well, you know, such and area didn't quite get the same, just the same level of information or wasn't done quite as well as as others you know can we give them some extra marks in the exam or something but i, I don't i don't see there's it's difficult in, in having a practical outworking i suppose of that but ati are taking the overall but uh, okay, look, uh, uh, appreciate morris is going to ask you i'll have to go after morris's question because the nope. executive's due to, nope. to, okay. due to sit remotely at 12. okay morris do you want to come in there morris have we lost Morris? Is he on mute? Morris, are you on mute by any chance? I think you've been saved, Minister. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I'll folks, then I'll, I'll have to go at this stage, uh, but I'll leave you. If there's any final points, uh, Derek can deal with those, but I'll have to head, head okay. upstairs for the. Uh, thanks very much indeed for your time, Minister. Much appreciated. Okay. Derek, you still there? I am, Chair. Okay. Um, can I uh, just ask also in relation to um, I realise it's not a direct responsibility for the department but in ter questions are beginning to be asked in terms of uh, post-primary transfer um, for this year and what are will there be any delay to post-primary transfer processes this year and will post-primary transfer tests proceed as normal in the autumn of this year for post-primary transfer next year? Yeah, I, I think, Chair, you hit the nail on the head when you said it's not a direct responsibility of the department. Obviously, we are interested. All I can say on that issue is that I know that the two organisations which deliver the transfer tests uh, on behalf of some schools are looking very, very hard at this and are considering all of the options because they realise that if things do not return to normal in the autumn, there is a big problem with this. So they are considering this, and we are keeping an eye on what they are doing. But um, as you know, these are not our tests. We don't regulate them, and we don't impose them, and we don't provide for them. But we are aware that the organisations are looking at this um, urgently. Okay, and as similar to the previous point raised in terms of. Um unequal access to educational opportunity. Um, what what planning is in, in place um, to ensure that any additional support that may be needed when schools return is available to pupils? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the question was, I don't know whether it was uh, Justin raised the question. Um, we do have a, I want to say a, a team, I might have mentioned this last week, I don't know, uh, um, a team, it's, it's one person or two people who are actually looking at what happens if and when things return to normal again, how do we stand up how do we stand up the department for one thing because um, even that's going to be difficult in its own right with people redeployed everywhere but looking more widely at the education sector and how do we stand up various services so 
they're starting to look at that issue. Now, we're only in the foothills of that, and we haven't got too far. We're also connecting to a bit of work that's going on more widely in other departments as to how we um, bring things back to normal at some point. Um, the Education and Training Inspectorate is involved with us in looking at that again. So I don't have any answers to, for you at this stage, okay. because we haven't done that planning, but we are starting to look at it as an issue. Okay. Um, and and in, in terms of transformation processes, I appreciate the Minister and yourself have said that there's a degree of uh, necessary suspension of such processes to ensure a, an effective response to the COVID challenge. But some of that transformation pertains to extremely important issues around uh, improvements in relation to statementing of special educational needs, for example. Is, is there any degree of ongoing activity in relation to some of the more urgent and serious transformation matters? Yeah, well, you're, you're right. I mean, I mean, there's transformation and transformation. The very specific transformation programme in the department, which I know the committee has been briefed on, has been stood down just about in its entirety because the people have been redeployed elsewhere. But um, what you're talking about, I think, um, specifically is a lot of work that was underway on various fronts outside of the transformation program in respect of, for example, special education needs. Now, I know we owe the committee a written response on that issue from correspondence that we got last week, but work is continuing on some of those issues, albeit at a lower level because staff have been redeployed, but we haven't stood everything down. But I will come back to the, or sorry, the department will come back, whether it's me or the minister, it'll probably be the minister who writes specifically on the issue of special education needs. What I do know is that there's a very large ring binder sitting on my desk with all of the draft regulations and the draft statutory uh, code of practice for special education needs, but obviously that hasn't made its way to the committee for consideration because of the current circumstances. But there is still work going on in some important areas, but I have to say it is much reduced in terms of its scale. Okay, and finally, Permanent Secretary, would you like to speak to the revised notices made under the Coronavirus Act 2020? Um, well, at, at a very general level, um, the yeah, I mean the the, the act, uh, which was enacted at Westminster, gives us very wide-ranging powers to do just about anything. Um, I think there were there have been a couple of notices made. Um, one was necessary to allow us to make payments in respect of free school meals directly to the families concerned uh, and change the arrangements. And the other one was simply to stand down a range of statutory duties which we felt could not be complied with in the current circumstances and change that to a best endeavour requirement of the wider education system. And that relates to things, as you've just mentioned, like um, statutory assessment under special education needs but other things as well. Um, we may have, I don't think we have made any directions under the Act, but we may have to make a direction under the Act in respect of school closures, and we may also have to make some kind of special direction in respect of examinations when the Minister announces his decision on how examination uh, grades will be awarded he may have to issue a particular direction to see it. Um, that's probably a technical detail, instructing them to do it in a different way. And all this will be for the record. Okay. I think the committee received the actual notices that were made. Yep. Um, they were, I think there's a statutory requirement under the Act for us to send the notices in writing to all interested stakeholders. Okay. Okay, Permanent Secretary, thank you very much indeed for your, your time today. It's much appreciated. Okay, Chair, just one more thing. Um, do, do you, you mentioned at the very start the pay offer that had been made to the NI Teaching Council. 
Do you have details of the information that lies behind that? David? Uh, Chairperson, there was a, a, there's something on the department's website just indicating what the percentage increases are and the identifying the nine key areas. I okay. think, okay. Chairperson, members might want to talk to officials about this tomorrow, or not tomorrow, next week, uh, when they come up to talk to us about the budget. Yeah, if, Permanent Secretary, if, if, you, um, if, if we're hearing from officials next Wednesday with regards to the budget, if there's any particular details that would be helpful for us to have with regards to the, the teacher pay um, offer in that context, that would be uh, gratefully received. Okay, that, 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 that's fine. I, I, mean, I, think, I think a lot of the information is on the website, in particular the nine work streams that are part of the overall package, but I think you, from what the clerk has said, I think you've got access to that. Okay. Um, but I'll bear that in mind uh, for officials who are, who are talking to the committee next week. Okay. Thanks very much indeed for your, your time today. Not at all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Goodbye. All the best. Bye bye. Okay. Members, content for uh, committee clerk to summarise actions uh, flowing from that briefing? Yep. Content? Great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. members. So if you're content, then the committee will write to the department seeking um, site of the uh, uh, Department of Health draft cross-sectoral action plan, which is going to deal with um, vulnerable children. Uh, I think we're probably also writing to the Department of Health about that as well. Uh, additionally, um, we'll be writing to the Department of Health around the childcare plan, about the administration and access. Um, uh, and also about the identification question, um, which would come up around the childcare settings. I know we got an answer, but we might get um, slightly more information, which uh, those who are lobbying might be interested in. Also writing to DE around uh, special schools assessment, the question that uh, Mr. Um, Crossan asked. Um, we're also then writing to the department just again about the hardship fund, seeking clarification on the numbers of teachers that are involved. Uh, and then perhaps also writing to the department about the number of vulnerable children on the waiting list. I know it's difficult to answer, but um, they said they might be able to get us more info. And then finally to the department around the provision of hardware from schools to their pupils, uh, whether this is being done, if there are any difficulties associated with that. So in addition to those things, does the committee also want to write to the Education Authority about school bus and taxi contracts just to see what the position is um is it going to run up to the end of june are they reassessing uh, do members also interested in asking the question whether the education authority is exploring whether they're going to look at clawing back the fuel costs because those costs aren't going to be run up and there will be implications then for <coughs> school meals as well because the school meal cost quite a lot of it ordinarily is <coughs> around transport and then um Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Can we just make one point? Yep. In, in in terms of the letters, these are all important issues that people have raised. But if you listen to the permanent secretary three times during he, what he said, with people being redeployed and about he owed us replies, you need to be flexible with these people. These people are dealing with huge situations <clears throat> with a reduced workforce, and so we do have to be mindful of that. I mean, we're going to send them another six or seven letters. Chairperson, with that in mind, we sent them about four or five um, last time. Is the committee content that we would just consider those to be largely closed? Since we're going to write to them again about substitute teachers, there's no need for them then to answer number 167, which we sent last week. And likewise, we'd ask them about um, the childcare sector. And I think it's more further to that correspondence. We're going to ask them something else. So my attitude would be, if members think it's right, uh, to be flexible with the department I'm not hounding them for answers. If they give us answers which are oral and members are happy, that's grand. If members have further questions, well, I'll just write those out. And the idea is to be helpful to the uh, permanent secretary because it can be quite hard to hear sometimes uh, what members are saying. So yep. if members are happy that I do that. Okay. Yep. Agreed. I'll go on the phones. Agreed. Okay. Very good. Jolly good. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, members, any other points to raise further to the departmental briefing? No, content. I think in regard to the substitute teacher issue, um, it, it's clear work is being done to try and extrapolate payment for substitute teachers that 
were contracted for January, February and March. I think the real area of concern is for those substitute teachers that weren't contracted and are not contracted for the months when the schools are closed. And I'm slightly more concerned after today than it was previously as to what exact help other than universal credit, etc., is going to be available to those teachers. Daniel, you raised that in particular. You want the comment? Yeah, I think I think that is important. And, and, and my, my question wasn't the first one to catch the minister out in any way. It, it, it's out of genuine concern for some teachers that have approached uh, uh, David and I in relation to this in recent weeks, and uh, and, and Justin as well. And I, I think I think that there needs to be clarification of what support is available. They have been caught in this trap through no fault of their own. And when they're seeing on the news every day that there's support for other sectors and people in work and people are self-employed, and they're basically being left to the side, I don't think it's fair on them. And we have to understand as well that, and I know the minister was, was honest in saying that some of them only do two days a week, but two days a week is a, a couple of hundred pounds too. Those people that have effectively since this been left with nothing. So we, we, we have to really uh, go at that and see what can be done. And I know that the finances are tight and I appreciate that entirely, but we can't simply uh, leave them out on the out on a limb simply because yeah. there was no contract there through no fault of their own. I'm sure those people, many young people, in fact, would love the contract if the opportunity had arose. And it's, I appreciate it. it is not easy to extrapolate for non-contracted uh, teachers, but they had referenced previously efforts to create a hardship fund and it, it felt like there was a bit of a retreat from that today which would be of concern to me but as you say we can keep a, a cl very close watching brief and uh, questioning of that particular issue any of if there are no other issues um i'll move us back to any other business to give members that weren't uh, dialed in earlier an opportunity if they wish to raise any other business. I, Clark, would like to propose that we write to the Education Authority CEO for an update on the implementation of the EA SEN audit recommendations uh, and the SEN early years consultation analysis that was to be provided to us um, in due course previously. Members content for that? Yep. Agreed. Okay. Uh, any other business members? Well, will we be, will be, will we be expanding to consider the Nikki report under that? Yes. Uh, sorry, Chair. Um, if I've heard the member correctly, if you look at our forward work program, um, there's a, a big to be arranged section, and one of those has got a subsection which is SEN, and in that is Nikki. And uh, so the expectation would be that we would have Nikki coming up here again, uh, and then the, uh, the Education Authority and indeed the Department to talk about uh, the, the new SEN framework. So that's all, um, all to be arranged. So I think what the Chair is suggesting is we write first to the Education Authority, see where they are, and then members can take a call on what they want to do. Do they yeah. want to try and hold the EA to account this way, or do you want to wait until maybe we can get them here in person? I agree to, to supplement that. And for the benefit of members that I don't think were quite dialed in when we dealt with the forward work program earlier, our next week's business is the department on the budget. Uh, the week after that is SIA on examinations. The week after that is child care sector. So you can see that within the restricted circumstances that we're functioning, that is still quite a, a detailed forward work program. In an ideal world, we would be meeting with the Education Authority with regards to the implementation of the SEN audit recommendations in lieu, of, <coughs> excuse me, in lieu of being able to do that in the immediate next few weeks. I think if we write to them in the first instance to seek a, a written update um, and consider at what point we can reschedule a meeting with them and indeed reschedule a meeting with the Children's Commissioner on um, the Children's Commission very detailed work around SEN as well, if members are content with that. Can I just yeah, speak? William Humphrey. Uh, yeah. uh, no difficulty, you and I were speaking before the meeting started about, about the, the issue around the EA and SEN. I have no difficulty writing to them, but I do think it would be useful for us to schedule in a, a, a phone-in 
mm. uh, with them, similar to what we had this morning, so that we can find out. Because it, look, these are hugely important issues, mm. um, and I know that there are other uh, pressing and imp hugely uh, important issues that the department and the EA are dealing with at the moment. But at the far end of this crisis, this is going to be a major issue. What we heard was horrifying in terms of the the uh, audit. Uh, and the outworking of that, and I know members will have had uh, representations from people within the EA around it. So I think we need to be um, getting getting a reply be, will be one issue, but I do think we very quickly need to have a, a um, uh, the EA's chief executive uh, in you know in front of this committee, and, and I don't mean waiting until uh, we're out of the COVID situation and having her here in person. We should have a, a, a conference call with her uh, around those issues as soon as we can. OK, I agree with that. And that's, that's helpful, William. On, on that note, members, next week is DE on budget. The week after that is C in exams. The week after that is child care sector. Do we propose the week four we <clears throat> endeavour to schedule a conference call with the EA CEO on the SEN audit and the early year SEN framework? Yep. yep, members agreed. Mm -hmm. Attempt with that, Clark? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe we look to schedule a similar teleconference call with the Children's Commissioner um, in due course as well, then. <coughs> members, any other business? No? Okay. Well, our, our next meeting then is scheduled for Wednesday, the 22nd of April at 9.45 in the Senate Chamber for those that can attend and teleconferencing for others. Uh, thanks very much indeed for your contribution today, members. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you, thanks, thanks, members. Okay, just gonna push the button. Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound.